Um, an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit, and I was going to recap a little bit anyway. Um, Senate Bill 146 regarding accessory dwelling units, it was signed into law by the governor on March 16th of this year. Um, that law takes effect, as Mr. Preston noted in the beginning, on June 1st, 2017. That would be RSA 674-71 when it takes effect. Um, Mark and I have been working with the Planning Board on updating our zoning ordinance um, to establish ADU regulations. Um, the issue is if the regulations are not in place by June 1st of 2017, then anyone could come in and establish an ADU anywhere in the town just by building permit. Um, that's a concern because, you know, it could have a def definite negative impact on neighborhoods and the community as a whole. We need regulations to actually, you know, oversee um, the establishment of these units. Um, as Mr. Preston had noted, I mean, it's not necessarily a bad thing everywhere, but there's certain neighborhoods that could be significantly impacted by these units, and that's why it's important to establish these regulations. Um, I know in, your, in an email you received um, some information regarding um, the um, accessory dwelling units. I was going to walk through the um, accessory dwelling unit um, sheet provided by New Hampshire Housing just to give an, up, an overview of everything that it involves. Um, with regard to the accessory dwelling unit, it must have an independent, must be an independent living unit, meaning it has its own sleeping, cooking, eating, and sanitation uh, facilities incorporated. Um, it must have an interior door between it and the principal dwelling unit. That's for attached accessory dwelling units. There are attached and detached, and we'll get into that a bit afterward. Um, and also it must have adequate water supply and sewage disposal. Uh, a municipality, there's things that a municipality may or may not do according to the state law in establishing its own ADU ordinance. Um, a municipality may control um, the appearance to maintain the look and feel of any single family home, um, such as architecture, driveways, and off-street parking. By the look and feel, you, you can make sure that there's no like, visible staircases from the roadway and so forth so that that home still looks like a single family home whether it has two units or one, you shouldn't be able to distinguish it from when it's just a single family without an ADU in it. Um, we may require owner occupancy of one of the units, but we can't say which one. The owner of the home can occupy the accessory dwelling unit or the principal dwelling unit if they choose, but we can require them to occupy one of those. Um, we can require, we may require demonstration that the unit is the owner's primary dwelling unit. So, you know, they, you know, they can't, it can't be like a vacation home for them. It has to be their primary dwelling unit. We can require that. Um, we can regulate the number of occupants per bedroom um, consistent with HUD laws. Um, continue to limit the number of unrelated individuals within a single unit. It allows for that. It allows to establish minimum and maximum ADU sizes. Um, but that gets into something with the must-nots as well. Um, with regard to that, we can't require it to be smaller than 750 square feet. Um, the owner may make it smaller, and this is a discussion we've had for months with this that's been a very complicated thing in, in communicating with others on this matter. Um, but we can require, we can't require it to be smaller than 750, but the owner, the way it's written, can make it smaller on their own accord. Um, a municipality must not require familial relationship between the occupants of the principal dwelling unit and the ADU. So it, it's not, typically you think of in-law apartments as a family member, you know, an elderly family member, a college student, somebody finishing up college, wanting to occupy that unit. We can't require that here. It can be, they can rent it to anybody they choose, according to the state law. Um, we can't require it to only have one bedroom, so two bedroom unit um, would be um, consistent with that. Um, we can't require additional lot area or additional dimensional standards, but we re can require that if we allow detached for those units. We can't require separate water and septic systems for the principal unit and the ADU, and we can't require that interior door that I spoke of earlier between an attached ADU and the uh, principal unit and the ADU for attached units to remain unlocked. You can't require that as well. Um, what I'd like to do now, we also received actually in your information, you have some information from the Rockingham Planning Commission, which we utilized in drafting our uh, amendment to this to this date, and uh, some good information in there. They highlight some of the concerns that we have about um, short-term rentals and uh, condominium conversion, for example. Um, 
what I'd like to do, and I believe you also have this, is a copy of our latest ordinance that's been updated uh, consistent with the last meeting that the planning board had last Wednesday evening. I'd just like to walk you through that quickly just to give you an overview of the ordinance and how it's structured. And then after that, I'll take any questions anybody has. Um, we have a definition set. In the definition section, we added a definition of accessory dwelling unit. That definition is consistent with the state law, what's, what's um, allowed under state law. We did add some language regarding, regarding detached accessory dwelling units um, because that is something that the planning board is looking at permitting here. So we added some language to that effect as well, along with the state's uh, model for definition. Um, we did add a new section, or Article 3A, for accessory dwelling units under our use regulations. Um, the use regulation on this 3.1 itself um, adds the reference to the accessory dwelling unit as well. Um, and then Article 3A would be part of that subsection of Article 3. Um, and I'll just go through these one by one. 3-A1, location and quantity does talk about allowing only one accessory dwelling unit per lot. Um, permits, uh, the planning board has expressed interest in doing this through a conditional use permit from the planning board, which we believe is, is a good oversight, good mechanism to, to handle this type of use. 3-A3 um, talks about provisions for living facilities. We talk about the sleeping, eating, cooking, and sanitation. Um, the board did want to be more specific on cooking and sanitation, so we highlighted stove, refrigerator, and sink for cooking, and shower, toilet, and sink for sanitation. So we have the reference to what a kitchen would typically have and what a bathroom would typically have. Um, we also talk about the uh, bedrooms, uh, no bedroom being less than 7 by 10, and in no, any case, no larger than 200 square feet in size. The next section, 3-A4, talks about occupancy requirements. Um, initially, we had looked at la um, laying out a bunch of different entities like LLCs and partnerships and corporations and so forth. Um, the board opted um, through some comments that we received subsequent to a, a more condensed approach. So we basically modeled the state law by just saying owner occupancy of either the single family dwelling unit or the accessory dwelling unit shall be required and that the owner shall demonstrate to the satisfaction of the planning board that one of the units is his or her principal place of residence. Um, they wanted a more consolidated format to that. Um, we talk about no more than two persons occupying a bedroom. Um, we talk about um, no more than six months at a time, or no le I'm sorry, no less than six months at a time that it can be rented out for. Um, that's so that we don't get, you know, with the seasonal rental sort of thing, the whole intent of this law is for permanent housing, permanent rental housing, so that um, assures that. Uh, we talk about the certificate of rental occupancy being current. Um, we talk about um, no home occupations or businesses um, being allowed. Um, site location and size. Um, we have we, there's where we talk about the detached units. We're talking about a detached unit only being permitted where within a structure that predates the enactment of this um, article and it's already detached from the principal dwelling unit so someone can't come along later and build a structure and say I'm doing this so I, and then I'm going to put an accessory dwelling unit a detached one in later and we use the existing foundation as establishing the footprint that meets that criteria and that was talked about with the planning board last week. Um, an accessory dwelling unit, the number that we came up with is shall be no more than 800 square feet in size. We talked about the possibility of a range or percentage, but that's that's where we where we landed at this point in time. Um, we have provisions for water supply and sewage disposal. Um, we're going to have to discuss with, with DPW a little more. They worked with us on that, and there's a few concerns that the board had with that. We're going to be working out those, those shortly. Um, in terms of dimensional requirements, um, you know, any ADU has to be consistent or conforming to the dimensional requirements that we have in the zoning ordinance. Um, one concern that we have is those RA and RAA zones. A lot of instances you have lots that are existing lots of record that are smaller than the minimum size that's uh, allowed today. Um, in those instances, um, 
if the accessory dwelling unit expands the footprint of the principal dwelling, we have it where those lots wouldn't be eligible for an accessory dwelling unit if they're causing if they're creating an expansion like that of a lot that's a pre-existing lot of record. Um, sprinkler system requirement for situations where there's three or more stories and condominium conversion, it's not eligible for condominium conversion. Um, impact fees um, would be um, the same as a impact fee for a duplex right now we charge that same impact fee for that accessory dwelling unit and the removal of the accessory dwelling unit would require a change of use from the planning board and building permit from the building department we also have parking uh, requirements that it has to meet the parking standards that we have in place for the ADU as well as the primary unit and then we in article 7 we amended that to incorporate the exterior design that we talked about that maintains the look and feel of a single family home and we think this accomplishes that. So it's a lot there, it's a large ordinance, a lot of work, several meetings went into it. Um, I don't know if Mark wants to add anything to, to what I've said. Um, obviously this has been a difficult prospect for the planning board which recognized early on that uh, this particular uh, one size fits all approach that's a, that's a, it's essentially a statewide zoning ordinance uh, does not really fit well in Hampton or in other beach uh, communities that have uh, beach uh, districts and that's been recognized by Rocky and Planning Commission there are other parts of the state that have similar problems uh, and so there are some probable in the future legislative changes that will come along uh, to recognize and deal with these, but for the moment we're uh, doing the best we can. Uh, the planning board has met four times on this and has had some uh, very extensive discussions about the various factors that you now see and will again, this will be posted for a public hearing uh, soon after the planning board gets one more look at the latest right. draft. They're looking for one more. Uh, but yeah. obviously a lot of work has gone into this. Jason has attended a number of different conferences where this has been discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, the Rocky and Planning Commission has been quite active in developing the model ordinance and in uh, pointing out the problems. Uh, so it's uh, a new subject for the entire state and uh, we've been dealing with it uh, quite comprehensively and the best we can. Any questions you have? Gina? Yeah, I just, I really want to congratulate the Planning Board because I read through this this afternoon and when I first heard of this bill, it you know, initially made me very nervous because mm -hmm. it had a chance of changing the characteristic of Absolutely. the whole town. And I think what the planning board has done, requiring that an owner, you know, an owner be there, the principal resident, and um, keeping, you know, the original footprint, I think it's a great job. And uh, I really, I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm glad that uh, we have a great planning board, and I'm glad that you're a town planner. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I've also paid a lot of attention to it, and I think I understand it, but I am going to ask some questions because people, these are questions that people have asked me, <clears throat> and I want them to be able to hear sure. uh, your response. Um, uh, do, obviously you did say the people don't have to be related. Yeah, you can't require a familial relationship according to the new law. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And uh, is when this is all done, will Hamptons be law be different uh, from the intent that the state had to begin with? I think you know, we're, we have to work within the parameters of what were provided by the state. So I think that. But you will be able to make tweaks to it. Well, certainly, and I, I mean, I think as, as Mark said, the legislation itself down the road may change, and, and that'll give us maybe some more flexibility as, as it, you know. But the Hampton Planning Board basically has to stick with the intent of this statewide. Correct. Yes. That's correct. Um, do, do there have to be further exits? Like, let's say the accessory uh, dwelling unit was on the third floor, mm -hmm. uh, and the primary exits were on the second floor. Mm -hmm. Like, would they be able to uh, make their entrance like to the second floor and still there would only be two exits on the second floor which the homeowner had to begin with I mean let's say if the homeowner was living on the second floor mm -hmm. and they had 
uh, their exits were on the second floor. Mm -hmm. And their accessory dwelling unit was on the third floor. Mm -hmm. With those, uh, the first unit, you know, the, on the second floor, would the exits and the entrances be acceptable for both the accessory dwelling unit and the primary residence space? That's a good question. And I think that, you know, it does talk about having, I believe it has to have its a common door between the two units, but I know it's a different situation if you're talking one above the other. Um, there might be instances where there is an exterior staircase or something, but it's not visible from the road, so you're not talking about something that that makes the house look any different. So there what are, if the primary staircase was on the second floor right? Um, that goes to this dwelling unit, uh, but those are where the exits were, too. Right. Um, so ordinarily, if there was another apartment above that, you would have to have two more exits. Right. But well, you would, still, you would still have to comply with whatever is required by building code, I'm sure, in terms of having proper egress, uh, ingress and egress. But think. for a primary resident that was entering on the second floor, right. that would suffice. Sure. The two exits. Correct. And what would happen... Um, if uh, if it's a mixed use building, okay. I mean, it it speaks. I think it's designed more for those instances where you have a, a single family home and somebody wants to add that unit to their single family home. I think that's well. There are a lot of single family homes that have. Uh, uh, businesses in them that's right. what a mixed use bin, business that's what a mixed use building is right. how Absolutely. does the state uh, deal with that right at the present that's that's a good question that's one that I don't think we've really well, Hampton's yeah. filled with places oh, I, like oh absolutely that. I think it's so that's going to be place. very very important we're going to take a look at that that's a good question I've already been contacted by three people that have that exact mm -hmm. issue mm-hmm and um, and it's long term that it's been that way. Okay. So I know that um, as far as insurance company is concerned, that it's not a commercial building if the the uh, commercial space is twenty five percent or less. Okay. And that same that is true also for the flood insurance policies. Yep. Okay. So. Um, I would like to know how the state deals with this, with the, uh, the way they already have it written. I would like a response. You, I'm not necessarily now, but if you yep. could get that back to me, I have some anxious people wanting to know. I think that's a very good question. It's not something that's really, in all the discussions and meetings we've attended, this has never come up, and that's a very good point, so we will look at that well, for you. Yeah, because that is what you're going to find a lot mm -hmm. of in Hampton. Yep. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to reiterate that, that uh, when this law was first passed, that the town attorney, the town planner, picked up on it immediately and began to work with it, and that in conjunction with the planning board has done a lot of work on this uh, mm -hmm. issue. And Rick's questions are really good, and I'm sure Jason good. will bring yep. those back, and, and Mark, and I'm sure that they'll work on those. We will, absolutely. So the, the people that I'm talking about, all of them are on normal size lots. Yep. And there are probably business seasonal lots. Yep. I would assume. And you will be posting when the public hearings are. Sure, that's right. Um, the board, the planning board, will see it one more, at least one more time before there is a public hearing. I would imagine maybe the first public hearing might be the first meeting in December. I'm just estimating. But, um, yeah, they'll be posted for public hearing. Copies of the ordinance will be available for people to view prior to that as well. Okay, and those will be posted on the website. We can put them on, like we've done in the past, we can put them on the website and have a copy in the planning office for people to view. Okay, so people can see them That's there. right, yep. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Thank you very much. And yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you very much. Yep. Yeah, you do a great job. Okay, I have Thanks to say that. Thank you very much. Yep.